Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation, which is in virtual mode and has been for the last six or seven months. We've put up a number of uh, videos, about 140, 150 short videos dealing with the same sorts of issues as we were dealing in the real, with in the real world. And many of those are tech related. And I'm delighted that we have one of one of the Western Hemisphere's major uh, tech entrepreneurs to come and talk about the future of the uh, digital economy, the future of the Internet, the future of financial services in a digital world. Pier Paolo Barbieri is the founder of Walla which is a uh, financial management, personal financial management tool, which is, I guess, sweeping Latin America from Argentina, moving northwards. Uh, he recently launched in Mexico. He's also the executive director of Green Mantle, which is a macroeconomic and geopolitical consulting firm. Uh, he's a sort of formidable guy. He defines himself on his Wikipedia page as an economic historian. Uh, he's written a book on Hitler and the Spanish Civil War. Uh, he was magna cum laude at Harvard. Uh, he has a, an M. I, an MPhil from Trinity Cambridge, uh, and I'm not quite sure what he ended up with at the Kennedy School, the Belfer Center at the Kennedy School. But the boy done good. Uh, and he's done good in all sorts of interesting areas. And I think he is one of the thinkers of the uh, of the future of the Internet. So I'm delighted that we've got him. My colleague, Leighton Hughes, has been doing, obviously, a little bit of work on this because he's uh, very much taken with uh, all the issues that Pier Paolo uh, has been looking at. Uh, so he's going to intervene as well. But first of all, Pier Paolo, tell us about Walla. First of all, thank you so much for having me. It's a great pleasure to be here with you and, and to connect with everyone again. Um, Walla is a, is a financial platform where we offer a marketplace of financial services for the digital economy. In short, we are the enablers of a digital economy in a region of the world that has been historically underserved. Just to put it in context, Latin America is a region of over 600 to 700 million people. 50% of which have never paid for anything with a means of payment that is not cash ever in their lives. And so as we think about a digital future and a pandemic that is both global and transformative of our economies, basically all those people are outside of that market. And so what we do is provide tools for them to get inserted into the economy. How do we do that? One account for everyone, completely free, no opening fees, no maintenance fees, no renewal fees, none of those stupid things that, that traditional institutions charge because they have no competition and because they love the cartel structure of their markets. And the second is a payment mechanism so you can access anything in the world. And so you know, when you're able to transact for your first Netflix account or your first Spotify account or your first Financial Times subscription, if that's what you want, then that transforms your daily life because from one moment to the next, you're no longer do, uh, condemned to using cash in your immediate proximity you can buy from anywhere in the world. And so we give everyone a global MasterCard that is completely free as well. And we started in Argentina where we have 8% of the country, that's the, the wallet. Um, we have 8% of the country in a staggering 19% of, of all young adults. So 18 to 25 year olds, we have 19% of the country in three years and, and one month. And um, this month, we, we sorry, uh, at the end of, of September, less than a month ago, we launched in Mexico. After 18 months of work, we, we are operating now in, in two of Latin America's largest economies. And we will focus on providing the same disruption to the Mexican market as we did the Argentine market. Well, let me ask you, I mean, both, both of those countries have taken a sharp turn to the left. Um, and at least looking at this from a European perspective, these sharp turns to the left usually end up in tears. They end up with capital controls. They end up with uh, multiple exchange rates. They end up with everybody putting their money into dollars and their you know, uh, black markets and block currencies and all sorts of ghastly things like that. How do you survive in that kind of an environment? Well, I mean, it, it is not easy to operate in Argentina. Um, the truth is that we have operated for 38 months. Uh, we have only had four months of those 38 that have not been recessionary. So that applied to both when we had a more right-wing neoliberal government and, and now that we have a more center-left uh, or left-wing government. 
And so we have been in a long crisis in Argentina. And I think it's particularly uh, unique for a company like Walla to have convinced over 8% of the whole country to join into the digital economy. That shows you what kind of transformation this is, that despite the, the lack of inclusion, despite the financial crisis, despite the capital controls, they have, they have come on board. Mexico well, actually, the, different the point I'm trying to make is, is, is the political and economic environment in countries like Argentina and uh, Mexico actually supportive of the kind of alternative finance that you're providing? Or does it work against you? Well, it depends on the local regulations. I think in Argentina, there's a lot of regulations that have, that have identified lack of financial inclusion as a problem. And, and despite the general disagreement on where the country is going, which I think is the worst problem for the country, they agree that both sides agree that this is a problem. Because if you're on the right, what you say is, look, I'm going to give people the ability to save and invest and, and build their own financial future. And if you're on the left, you say, well, you know, find, you know, condemning people to cash is further exclusionary. And so everybody agrees that financial inclusion is a good thing. And so across Latin America, right and left, we're seeing countries wanting more financial inclusion. And we are a tool of financial inclusion. And so Mexico is a lot more stable. So you, regardless of what you say about Mexico, you know, it's one of the lowest debts in the world. It has a very credible central bank. It has an inflation that has been under control since, since the 1990s. And it has very credible management, regardless of, of, of you know, the, the administration that is in power. And in particular, the Lopez Obrador administration and those administration is a big believer in financial inclusion because they are aghast at the fact that 70% of the country has never had a payment mechanism. That means that all those people cannot save, they cannot build a credit history, and they cannot get a loan. And so if you approach this from, from a left-wing perspective, what you want is every one of those people to have the ability to save and the ability to, to borrow and the ability to one day, you know, installize a purchase. Because otherwise, it's, you know, the distance between the rich and the poor is just all the greater in a digital economy. Well, just explain to us how uh, Walla can produce something which is actually cheaper than cash for um, disadvantaged groups in, in, in Latin America. Yeah, that's a great point. First of all, cash is expensive. Cash is paid by the government. And when you have high inflation, like you do in Argentina, you have to print a lot more bills. And printing bills has gotten more expensive over time. They're difficult to manage, and they require uh, extra security. Not to mention that when you're an individual, somebody takes away your cash, they take away your livelihood. The, the good thing about digital money is that it lives here. This is your branch. And so when your phone becomes your branch, then you radically reduce the costs of transacting. For the business that takes the payment, taking cards is, a, is, is, is charging them a fee. It's the interchange fee that is regulated in every market. But, but a lot of these businesses prefer that because it's safer than they're relying on cash in the register. It's a lot easier to do accounting on. It's a lot easier to track for the government for tax paying purposes. And you don't need to pay somebody to manage your cash. In these economies, businesses usually hire somebody to manage their cash for them. And that's more expensive than to take a payment in card method. And from the perspective of people, they say, well, this account is free, this card is free. It allows me to transact anywhere in the world that I want via the internet. And at the same time, it doesn't have the weakness of having to walk around in a difficult neighborhood. You know, I get many emails about this. And whenever you take a Walla, you get my personal email. So I get a lot of email. But you, all these people really appreciate the fact that this is safe because unless you have your PIN number, nobody can transact with your account, whereas cash can be taken away from you. So just tell us, what is the, uh, what's the cost of Walla to a, uh, to a consumer? Zero. It's completely free. And I, we think that there is revolution in transparency here because what you say is the account is free, the card is free. When I go pay at a cafe and I pay, you know, four pounds, the, the, it is the, is the cafe owner that via the MasterCard network is paying us a fee on the back end. But from the perspective of the consumer, it's completely free. And this changes something that is very important in these markets like Mexico and Argentina. For a long, long time, when people needed to top up services or pay their bills, 
they went to places and they literally physically went to places to queue up. And in those places, they charged them an added fee. Andrew, do you want to pay for your gas bill? You got to pay an extra pound to the company that pays that. That is effectively taxing the digitization of money. Mm -hmm. And we've done away with that. So when you top up Walla, it is completely free. We pay okay, for that. Okay, so tell me where you make your money. You we make it from the, the fee no, no, so, with MasterCard. Yeah, so, so yeah, we get the fee from MasterCard. And on the back end, the, the gas provider or the electricity provider wants Walla payments because the fee that we charge them is a lot lower than the places where people used to queue up. So it's easier for the person that, that used to queue up because they don't have to queue up. It's cheaper for the company that gets their payments paid. And it's better for Walla because we get a fee for that, but it's a lower fee. And because we use technology, we run Walla, we run almost 3 million accounts with less than 500 people. So we, are, we estimate that we reduce between 80 and 90% of the costs of running a traditional institution. And that allows us to not charge for something that other people used to charge. So, but why doesn't MasterCard come in and cut you out? Because MasterCard is not, MasterCard is a network of issuers. I am a MasterCard issuer, right? MasterCard needs many of us. What MasterCard doesn't do is do it on their own because they, they're not gonna, you know, in order to run one Walla, you need to have a variety of, of connections. You have to have a processor and a, and a brand like MasterCard and you have to have the bill payment arm and you have to have the cash in. And MasterCard is not in that business. Right. Visa is not in that business. But MasterCard, again. MasterCard and Visa do have existing relationships with banks in Argentina and in Mexico. Yeah, and they, and they, and, but, but the future is us, not the banks, because the banks move very slowly. And so only three years after we showed up, the banks are starting to provide free accounts. And so from the perspective of MasterCard, there's the banks that have a big base of cards that grow, you know, one to 2% a year. And then there's me. I'm issuing around 0.3% of the country every month. So every three months, I do 1% of Argentina. That's crazy. From MasterCard's perspective, MasterCard is very committed to financial inclusion around the world. They, from their perspective, we're the best thing that has ever happened because here I am bringing all these people onto the MasterCard network that weren't there before. They didn't have a card before and nobody had given them a card for free. We are. So from their perspective, we're great news. Okay, what's your next move? I mean, I, I keep looking at uh, the Hispanicization of North America and I think, wow, here's an opportunity. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, you're, you're not the first to, to, to mention that. We think that the biggest opportunity is in Mexico today because um, you know 70% of Mexico has never had a card. More importantly, the gender uh, division in Mexico is astounding. So two times more women have not had access to financial services than men. And we have a big commitment here, you know, over 42% of Walla is female, half my management team is female. We make product for everyone. And so to help women in Mexico be able to create a credit history and uh, take a loan, and to be able to have a savings product is truly revolutionary. And we are working to expand the base in Mexico. Right now, when you sign up for Walla, you get the card anywhere you are in Mexico in less than 72 hours that didn't exist before. And so what we want is to really focus on the Mexican market. And that Mexican market then is connected, not just to the United States, but also to Central America. Because Mexico is a, is a place where remittances are a huge part of the economy. And so if we are successful in Mexico, that will open the door for the North, but also for the South. And I think that this is the most unbanked large country in the Americas. And what are the and criteria? It, you, I mean, what are the criteria for giving a card to someone? I mean, you're dealing no. with, let's say, women who don't, as you say yourself, don't have a credit, credit history at all, many of whom may be semi-literate. I mean, what yeah, so, so, criteria? So what we do, we, what we do is, is, is create a product that is radically simple, very transparent, and we give debit to everyone. And what we do is create a history because if I have to give a loan to Leighton, for instance, um, in Argentina, I already have loans operational and I have installments operational. And so the, I, I give everybody a debit card. And the debit card, I'm incurring no risk, mm -hmm. right? Because you can only spend what you've added. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. But then as I get to know Leighton and I see that he's paid his gas bill and he's paid his telephone bill and he's paid for Netflix and he likes the Financial Times and he has a subscription to the Wall Street Journal, all these things add up. And when I see that, I can then give him a first loan. If Leighton had only operated in cash, I have no information about him. So the cost of that credit is definitionally higher. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. With the data that we get from MasterCard, which we graph in the app and we give it to all users so that you can see how you spend, where you spend, and in learn how you are spending, which is also a popular product in Europe, we use that information on the back end to cr originate credit. And also to tell Leighton, okay, you get paid on the second of the month. Why don't you invest this money and you know, get a return on that investment? Mm -hmm. And so the, the opportunities are to, to, to sell a variety of, of, of financial products and educate people like you said, that I've never had a product before, but you have to start with a debit card. Okay, so, so what other financial products are you selling in a mature market, I suppose? Your most mature market is Argentina. What, so, so in Argentina. Are you acting as a, an originator of loans or are you sort yeah. of so, you know, passing the, this business on in a hub and spoke model no, to no. the providers? So, so there are three pillars of Walla. There's the payment pillar. On the payment pillar, we have the MasterCard, online purchases, all cell phone top-ups, the transportation card, which is like the Oyster card, and 4,000 providers of bill payment, which is everything, you know, gas, water, telephone, cable, internet, whatever. That's payments. So we're connected to all that. Plus anywhere in the world where you can use the MasterCard, you can use it and pay with Wallet. On the savings side, we have partnered with, a, with a, one of the top three asset managers in Argentina to sell, um, a, a money market account. So that's our first savings product. This launched 10 months ago. In 10 months, we have created over 730,000 accounts, which means that, that we have 30% of the money market accounts in the country in 10 months. On the savings side, we have created a personal loan product where we lend you anything from one to $5,000 and then an installment product, which is very new. We launched it in the pandemic, where you say, look, I went and bought the AirPods, right? So it's a $200 product. Walla can installize that purchase. And so, you know, you, you get the money back and you give it to Walla in three months or in four months or in five months. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's another, another product that we have. And we've also in, created this engine for... Um, spending analysis, which covers every product. So it is able to graph and teach you how you spend so that you spend better. Those are the products that we have today. And, and, you know, and, in, and in Mexico, we were able to launch with all the, the, the payment product done day one. So you know, in Argentina, it took us 18 months to create that. In Mexico, day one, we had bill payment, we had cell phone top-ups, we had the MasterCard, we had online purchases, we have spending analysis, we have a lot. And finally, one more thing that is crucial, it is completely interoperable with the system. So you can send money from any bank into Walla and from Walla to any bank. Insurance products? Not yet, but, but, but I see, I like where you're going. Uh -huh. I, can't talk about, I, can, I can't talk about what we haven't launched, but... Yeah, I, I just thought that in, in all these markets, the insurance market is probably the least developed of all the markets. Leighton, your thoughts. Andrew, Andrew, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to hire you. <laughs> please, please. But by the way, yeah, by yeah. the way, I, I, it's something very important that I, that is a little bit controversial. Nobody wants an insurance app. Mm. Like nobody wants to have an insurance app on their phone. It makes no sense because insurance is one of those things that you're never supposed to see. It's like your health insurance. You want to see it when you need it, but you don't want to see it every day. Maybe in a pandemic, right? But, but you don't want to check on your insurance every day. You have to have it available, but it, it, it is not on a day-to-day -day occurrence, like buying something with a MasterCard. Every time I go buy a coffee, I pay with a card. That's a daily thing. Insurance is a quarterly or yearly thing. I only think about my apartment insurance once a year when I have to renew. Otherwise, I don't think about it. And so the digitization of insurance is going to be a huge, huge trend. And we have done nothing on this. 
And so in Mexico and Argentina, for instance, it's obligatory if you have a car or if you have a motorbike to have insurance. But all that depends on paper. And so I think there's a huge opportunity there. Well, there is. I mean, one of the things that we have been looking at, of course, is insurance uh, on a per, per mile, per hour basis, rather than on a sort of periodic year by year basis. So you yeah. insure the car when you use it, which may be much more sensible for uh, poor people. Uh, not not even necessarily a car you own, but a car you drive. Leighton, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I um been listening very in, in uh, with great interest. And I, I when we last spoke to us, uh, you you had issued one hundred forty thousand cards. I was just wondering, firstly, like what's what's the update on that in in Argentina, but also, um, you, we've we've seen like immense levels of digitization. Um, over the past six months, um, do you have a, I, I, before the pandemic, you said that you were looking uh, five to seven years before profitability. I, surely that's changed now. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, the truth is that, that we see the pandemic as an accelerant. And so mm. the changes that we expected over five years have happened over one and so, you know, if I look at the beginning of the year, 90% of the money that was being put on the Walla network came from cash. Yeah. Now, 40% is digital. So it's only 60% cash. I only expected to get there in 2023, and I got there in 2020. I don't mm -hmm. think we're going back. Same, similarly, bill payment we, you know, we have a relatively young base. A lot of the people that we serve are people that are still living with their parents in Latin America. And so um, those people didn't used to pay bills because they didn't have to pay gas or water or telephone. But now the pandemic has made our, our base older and those people do use the product. So the product has grown 350 to 400% in six months which is like crazy. We didn't expect that. Mm. And so that's not going back. Once you've, once you've taught yourself to scan the bill with your cell phone camera and pay it that way, why would you spend half an hour of your day queuing up to pay a gas bill? You're not going to do that. But let's, so, let's be realistic. I mean, the, the pandemic has done huge macroeconomic damage to Latin America and the credit worthiness of individuals has been devastated. I mean, that must that must come through. To, are you a benefit? We see it. No, 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 no. We're not. I mean, the macro hurts us. The macro is definitely bad. And I'm not going to deny it. Like what I'm telling you is that more and more of the wallet. So say somebody made five hundred dollars. Now they're making four hundred dollars. Right. So credit worthiness is down. But of those four hundred dollars, they need to spend more of that money digitally. Yeah. So when the economy recovers and I trust that it will recover, then we don't think we're going back to previous levels of cash usage. And so if you have one of the, you know, if you have the best product at a moment of digitization, you benefit from that transition, even if the macro is dismal, because let's agree the macro is dismal. Mm. But what happened in Europe is that at a time of, of stress, a lot of people dropped the neobanks, the, the, their secondary accounts or their techie accounts, and they went back to mom and dad's bank, the high street bank. Mm -hmm. But in Latin America, they didn't have a high street bank. So they stuck with us. In fact, they use us more mm -hmm. because they need more digital products and we are the enablers of that digital economy. Mm -hmm. it is, is, does this mean, I mean, has the pandemic accelerated your growth in that you know you you maybe wouldn't have gone into mexico without a pandemic or no, we were going to launch into mexico absolutely we've been working on it for 18 months but yeah. it, it fast forward in development obviously it was much harder logistically because we were able we had to launch in the middle of a pandemic i couldn't even fly to mexico to launch my product like i haven't been to mexico argentina had a seven month lockup we, we are still not able to open our offices the point is that everybody's working remotely but the, the need for Walla is much higher. And so there were months in, in March, April, and May when instead of, we usually you know, create around 80,000 cards a month or 100,000 cards a month. There were months when we were doing 150. 
There was one time when, when there was um, four days that because of a government change, uh, the factories were closed in the, in the lockdown and um, the, the card factory was closed. So the place where they print your name on the MasterCard was closed. By the time they reopened, we had to print 50,000 cards. It was like five days, which is crazy. I mean, that's, a, that's like 0.2% of the country. And so, you know, the demand for these kinds of products and not just us, like the ecosystem is much bigger. And so I think that that digitization is, a, is necessary if we want the recovery when it comes to be equal. Otherwise, those that who don't have an account are relegated and much worse off. I, I'm slightly concerned about one thing. I can see the, the appeal at the card end, but when you get into these higher value products like credit, um, you're, you're increasing your exposure at a time when people's credit worthiness is declining. And particularly, you're going into markets where people are not really aware of the culture of repayment. Which is why we've been, very, we've been very careful with credit. So credit is the one area where we're not going out crazy. So we, we, you know, we launched it a year ago and we have been growing very organically and carefully because credit, as you rightly say, credit is one of the things where if you go too fast, you're going to crash. Mm. And so um, savings accounts, everyone, um, you know, uh, uh, bill payment, everyone, cell phone top ups, everyone, cards, everyone, credit, slowly. Because the last thing we want to do, if you do a batch of bad credit, you'll never be able to originate again. Okay, let's broaden this. I mean, the, yeah. I think Walla is an absolutely fascinating, uh, fascinating project, and you know, it's it's um, more power to you. I, I hope you manage to fund your third yacht within <laughs> at least eighteen months. No yacht, no yacht. <laughs> Where are the yacht? I never understood. I never understood why people want a yacht, but that's a different. Uh, different <laughs> Do you have tell us, to go tell us a little bit more about how you see the whole digital world changing, partly as a result of, of coronavirus, but also just the secular trends that you, as somebody who has both an emerging markets background and a very sophisticated Harvard background. No, I think I think look, I think this is a one-way street, even in the United States. We see the United States as, as one of the most advanced e-commerce countries in the world. And yet they are 20 percentage points lower than China in terms of, of digital transactions. So the future in this case is not the United States. The United States' future is China and the world's future is China. And so if you look at economies in Latin America or the emerging markets, 10% of Mexican retail happens online. 15% of Argentine retail happens online. 20% of Brazilian retail happens online. I don't know many things with certainty in my life. I know with certainty those numbers are only going to go up. So if you have to bet on something, you have to bet on the doubling, the tripling, the quadrupling of the digital economy. That means less retail, more e-commerce. So whatever platform, leave aside Walla. Whatever platform that allows for this digitization, Shopify, Square, you know, Stripe, um, Walmart, Amazon, you know, uh, Mercado Libre, anything that, that helps businesses either sell, transform, or find new ways to, to do commerce online will be boosted. It has to happen. And so it's particularly obvious in countries where distances are big and, and digitization is low. Because the opportunities aren't really there. I mean, historically speaking, if you look at the evolution of e-commerce in the United States, the opportunities are not there when you go from 40% to 60%. The opportunities are there when you go from 10%, like you were in 2000, to 30%, which is where you are now. That's when you create Amazon, and Shopify and you know Square and Stripe. Other then it's just the big ones growing, but the opportunity for new entrants happens at that precise moment. And in places like Latin America, I think that the sky's the limit. And that will help on a very important topic that we touched upon in a previous conversation, which is taxation. One of the biggest problems in Latin America is that is the size of the black economy. 
the undeclared economy. Mm -hmm. In a digital world, it's much harder to avoid the tax man. And that's a good thing for authorities in Mexico, Colombia, Peru, Argentina. Because yes, the but at the same time, be real. The people who are using cash are using it in part because they don't, don't want to pay tax. If they come into the, the tax net, they are all of a sudden that is a hidden cost to them, is it not? Absolutely. But but the truth is that if we don't widen the tax bases, then there's very few people paying a lot of tax. Mm -hmm. And what we need is everyone paying their first share. So you want to suck them in first by telling them it's free, and then the taxman knocks up the, on their door. I'm not, I'm not a tool of the government. I'm, I, but right now, if you have undeclared money, you can't pay for Netflix. You can't get a Spotify account. You can't you know, uh, buy uh, something on Amazon.com. You just can't. It's cash. So that economy will continue, but it will be cash-driven. Mm -hmm. The digital economy is, is harder, not impossible, but harder to, to avoid taxation. And what That's about not a bad thing because it should allow for lower tax rates if more people pay tax. Yeah. What about the, uh, the, the role of the central bank? I mean, central bank digital cash is one of the big issues that we're grappling with in Europe. Uh, and the Fed is also talking about it. What's your thinking on uh, CBDC? I think that I have, a, I have a controversial view on this, which is that um, money is one of the two key things where the state has monopoly power. The use of arms and violence and money. That's the system we've built. So I think that Bitcoin and similarly, you know, similar cryptocurrencies are digital assets that are useful for the diversification of certain portfolios, but they're not money. Mm -hmm. And states will never accept them as money. And so if you look at the needs, Nobody has been able to explain to me why the hell digital money needs to be different from money. We don't need blockchain. We don't need a decentralized database. This, the Fed is the only issuer of dollars. Why do you need it to be decentralized? Why do you need an E in front of the dollar? You just need the dollar. But you need better transfer infrastructure. The problem with the dollar and the euro, less so the euro than the dollar, is that the dollar's infrastructure is 1970s technology, is SWIFT. And we have put so many rules on that infrastructure, and the United States has used it politically so many times to impose on its allies its vision of the world, that even the European allies are saying, actually, I don't want this bullshit. What we need is an unhindered dollar. It doesn't have to be E, it doesn't have to be Bitcoin, it doesn't have to be blockchain. It doesn't have to have all these empty huff words like that we use, it, AR, AI. It, next I'm gonna hear it's a clean dollar. Like we don't need that. What we need is a dollar with a transfer protocol that is cheap, open, and interoperable. Because as I keep telling the authorities in Argentina, Money laundering, and, and by the way, there is, there is good work done on this by the World Bank and by the IMF. Money laundering doesn't happen in increments of $500. It doesn't happen in increments of $1,000. It happens in increments of hundreds and, and millions of dollars, and sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars. So what you need is a rule that says, look, if you're going to transact dollars below $5,000 a month, do it, digitize then KYC, AML, rules on, on international transfers, um, um, anti-terrorism uh, lists, all that applies to 5,000 and over. So just let's, let's de just debate the number. And, and below that, let's just make a Venmo, like a, tran a easy transfer. Europe has a very good protocol for transfer. Now I can send money from my Italian bank to a German bank live. In the United States, that doesn't happen. And that's the Fed's problem. So the Fed needs a Fed now protocol for everyone. And if not, the Chinese are going to keep winning because the Chinese create a low cost, open, and, and very fast infrastructure that but is in not fact, hindered by SWIFT. Sorry. At the moment, regulations are tightening on cross border financial transfers rather than easing. And it makes that's life extraordinarily difficult for people 
with for remittances back from the United States to Central America, but from Africa. I, mean, I don't think that, you know, if, 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 if somebody in the United States sends their relative in Guatemala or in Nicaragua, $500 a month, I don't think that's something that should be in the rules of the BIS. Because if you, if you block that transaction, then Alipay is going to come and say, you know what, use my system. I guarantee you it's going to be cheaper, faster, easier, instant. You lost. Like America has the exorbitant privilege. It shouldn't lose, lose that exorbitant privilege in the digitization age. If we stick to SWIFT with all the shitty old technology on SWIFT, with all the rules that we've put on SWIFT to control the big banks, then we're going to lose the, the battle in emerging markets. And then you will see the internationalization of, of Alipay and of Union Pay and of alternative cheap transfer systems. What we need is an American a Fed sponsored international transfer system. And instead of instead we, we go in circles around the same tired, empty ideas of blockchain, of like decentralized databases, AI, AR, it, you know, just like this just by the way, and it should also be private. As you said in the beginning, it should also be a private protocol. If you're moving $400 a month, Make it anonymous. You, you want to add a level of, of control? Fine, do it above a threshold. Mm -hmm. But for most of the emerging markets, people don't transact more than $2,000 a month. It's higher than the minimum wage in Italy or, or Spain. I, I couldn't agree with you more. However, I do see the political tide running in the opposite direction. And if it continues to run in that direction, as I fear it will with all the ash with all the hoo-ha of terrorist financing in particular. Um, what do the Chinese do? I mean, is there really an internationalization of the renminbi? Well, the, the key weakness of the RM, uh, RMB is that it's not convertible. And so if I cannot convert the RMB freely because of the capital controls that exist in China, and they're some of the tightest capital controls in the world, then who's gonna really want the RMB for the long term? It's very difficult to internationalize a currency that isn't convertible. The Germans learned this in the 1930s and Britain learned this the opposite way by being completely open and convertible in the gold standard. The beauty of the, of the pound sterling was that there was a rate of convertibility to the, to the gold standard that existed and the Bank of England, except for very, very brief periods, always respected. And so it's very difficult to internationalize a currency if you don't have that convertibility. The Chinese are no, no dummies, they know that. And so what they're proposing is different. They're proposing a transfer protocol that connects wallets around the world, where you create a parallel system to SWIFT. So SWIFT exists for the banks and the wallets can connect to each other. You just pick the biggest wallets in the world. You go to M-Pesa in Kenya, you go to Paytm in India and, and Reliance in India, and you offer them a, a connection to the Chinese wallet. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, if you are a small business owner in India who's selling something to China, you're gonna say, wait, I don't need to go through my bank and my you know, correspondent bank. I'm just gonna wire money and from my wallet connect to the other wallet. So I think their objective is, is a transfer system that is intra-wallet, international, very cheap, like TransferWise, who does it with banks in a very, very techy way, amazing product they have. I really greatly admire them. Um, and um, tech-based, mm -hmm. so that the and costs it of- It will be based on the, bank, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. I mean, that takes yeah. Chinese influence and Chinese companies to all- parts of the world. Of course, of course. And, and it, it, is, it is, you know, they, they, they think of, of uh, financial inclusion and, and, and Chinese finance as one of the pillars of Belt and Road. Mm. So they're building it. The problem is that on the West, we don't have an equivalent standard. Mm -hmm. I don't understand why the Bank of England, the Fed and the ECB don't have a, a correspondent banking network that is cheaper and faster than SWIFT. You don't need to create, you don't need to run it. You just need to create a protocol and tell the banks, get on this. Tell the FinTechs, get on this. You will have a bank license, you have to get on this system. 
just like in, in Brazil, Mexico, India, and in Argentina as well, the central bank has said, if you want to exist in this market, you have to operate in this protocol. So you just create a standard and then you let the private sector operate in it. But the Chinese are creating that standard and Ant and Tencent are going to export it to the world. So it's stupid of us not to have a standard. Okay, let me ask you a little bit about Europe. I mean, Europe, yeah. obviously the UK has just cut itself off and is now swimming merrily out into the middle of the Atlantic. But the Europeans themselves are, and particularly the European Parliament, is extraordinarily concerned about privacy issues, data movement. Is this um, something that's incompatible with the kind of digitalization that you envisage? I mean, are we, ought we to be concerned that we are going to kill the goose that lays the golden egg by worrying too much about privacy? Not at all. I think privacy is a human right. And I think that, that when everything is free, you are the product. When, when, you know, when you don't pay for something, you are the product. And we see in our political systems the, the consequences of, of not caring enough and letting companies do whatever they want as long as it's free. So I definitely believe that we need to change our approach to, to privacy and to antitrust as a result of that. Uh -huh. Because the, the winner-take-all winner structures make no sense. So let me go back to my market, banking. Why does Santander get to have all my data about all my transactions since I was born and not have to share it. Why? They don't, it's not their data, it's my data. It's my bank account. And so what I propose is that countries like Argentina, and I've said this publicly, Brazil is doing it and I admire them for it. They need to force open banking on their institutions because otherwise the banks are just gonna keep the data and the one who loses is you. Because if Santander is the only one who's ever gonna offer you credit, guess how expensive that credit is going to be. But if suddenly Leighton might offer me credit based on the same data, mm -hmm. or, or you know, Andrew might find Monzo to offer me credit on that data, then the data is the individuals. And so I've said publicly, and I reiterated today, we need the central banks to create that standard. Because otherwise, you know, there's private companies that do this, but there's no control. Who controls the private company that offers the open banking plugin? It's a, I can't trust it because these guys with an Amazon account. Mm -hmm. So we need, I think the Europeans have done something amazingly well, which is to say, look, this is our standard. And in this standard, the data is open. And, and any institution can access the data if they have permission from the user. So obviously, you know, uh, Barclay shouldn't be able to access my data if I say Barclay shouldn't. But, but if I have my Santander data, my Barclays app, should be able to read that and therefore inform better credit. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's a private situation and you have what the users in the US, which is one company, FICO, that sits in the middle and has monopoly access to everything. And so they, they make a lot of money and, and people don't have good credit. But that's still better than what we had in Europe before, which is that everybody had their own silos. And, and you know, like my favorite stat about the UK, people change their romantic partners more often than they change their banks because it's harder. You know, changing a bank is harder than getting a divorce. Believe me, so, you know, more expensive to change your partner. Um, that's a different matter, that's a different matter. I want to, uh, you raised one thing there. I really want to ask you about the, uh, the American shift, I mean, to, to use competition authorities to uh, tackle big tech uh, and the announcement by the Department of Justice that it was investigating uh, Google, uh, not Microsoft, but Google. Is this is this an important thing in your in your opinion? I think this is crucially important. I think that look, I am I love Google. I think that the reason why we have this is because they've won. Google creates the best products, same as Amazon and the same as Facebook. But there is a level of concentration in the market in which it's impossible to have new entrants. And that lowers growth, lowers competition, lowers choice, and that creates a problem. And so we need dynamic capitalism. Inclusive capitalism is dynamic capitalism. When there's winners and there's losers, and I don't want a monopoly for Walla. And so the day, if I ever have a monopoly, bring back this video, like Lindsey Graham said, and, and regulate me. Because <laughs> that's not what we want. Otherwise, 
we will live in an ossified society. And, and I think that some changes are needed. I don't think we need to go as far as to break up Google, but I don't, I don't think that's necessarily the end. But, you know, should Android be Google's? Probably not. Mm-hmm. Same as Apple shouldn't be able to sell their products and put them first. I think as Spotify is right. I love Spotify and I also love Apple. But like you shouldn't you shouldn't allow Apple to display Spotify and put Apple Music on top. You need to create a level playing field. And I think if you do that, then 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 the structure of capitalism wins because it's more credible against those that say capitalism is a crony system. I do think that uh, it should be hammered home that the best thing that ever happened to technology was the breakup of AT and T. A hundred percent. That's the why, moment. and that's why the, the message to Google should be: you've won. You you've won. You're you you already won. Okay, you now won. let's bring back the game. Yeah, you've won. Here's the gold watch. Let's start again. Uh, exactly. Leighton. Exactly. Leighton, we've got about five minutes. What's your your take on this? Yeah, I I, um, I was really interested to hear what you said about uh, you know possible uh, digital Chinese currency. And I mean, you seem to say that the Bank of England, uh, I mean, is the Bank of England being proportionate in its uh, sort of engagement with this idea? Because they're sort of a bit hesitant. They say that no blockchain is needed. And I I agree with all of you. I agree. I agree with the Bank of England. No blockchain is needed. I think blockchain is one of those puff words that people insert. And, and, you know, most ICOs have ended in utter failure and stealing from people their savings. So I'm no fan of blockchain. I think that Bitcoin is a digital asset that acts as digital gold with all the good things and the bad things of gold. Um, but at the same time, I think, I think what, what the Bank of England has done is very good for the UK market. But like Andrew said, the UK is now going to be a much smaller market than it would otherwise have been and have access to a much smaller uh, portion of the global economy. The UK is 2% or 2.5% of global GDP. That's it. So if you want to remain relevant, I think you need a, a transfer protocol that covers other markets. And in that sense, it is obvious that given the union of the economies with the Eurozone, you should have a transfer system that works both ways. Although, you know, in this day and age, given the conflicts over fisheries, it's not easy to envision that you happily agree to a, to a transfer protocol. I was wondering- You can't that- agree to the fish. Fish is fish. Uh, it's very important. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. I'm just so tired of reading about bloody fish policy. How? Because um, we've talked a lot about you know the global the global dynamics. I mean, purely from a uh, London-based think tank point of view, is do you? How do you see London and its role in the in the in the world? I mean, it's obviously going through a lot of pressure and. Can it remain? Not just, how do you, not just how do you see London, but how could London actually position itself better going forward? Look, I, I love London. I have a great uh, affection for the city. I, I, I've lived there and I would love to live there again. I think the quality of London is, the quality of life in London is, is hard to surpass, especially given the airports. But I think that Brexit has been a huge hit. I think that we don't really understand the impact of Brexit in new generations. But when you talk to people under 25, all the people that used to flock into London to start companies, to think about companies, to have a first job and then, you know, be, do something creative are now thinking. And so you're losing some of those people. The pandemic is going to hit big cities, but only for a limited period of time. I think that, that for the next two years, New York and London are gonna suffer and they will become cheaper, younger, and grungier, and that's a good thing because it, 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 you don't want, you know, to quote Michel Welbeck, who's one of my favorite authors, you know, you don't want a museum. You know, you don't want a museum because that, that, that's a dead city. And that works for Rome, I love Rome, but, but it doesn't work if you want to have a, a bastion of, of creativity. And so I think that what London should aim to do is, is be at the forefront of, of the FinTech revolution. It's done a great, great work. But, the, but over the last two to three years, ever since the Brexit vote, if I think about where the new companies are popping up, they're in finance at least, they're not popping up in London. They're popping up on the continent. They're popping up in Germany. They're popping up in Spain. They're popping up in, in East Asia. And so I think we are losing some of the people that would have otherwise gone to London. I think that London needs to be at the forefront of regulation. The Bank of England did something really great, which was to allow fintechs to connect directly to the bank. That was very clever. And I... I 
I think they should keep up that kind of policy that furthers innovation in a safe way, right? In a, in, you should protect consumers against harmful financial services. I don't want gamification of options trading. That's not what I'm proposing. But what I am proposing is, is, a, is a London that in order to remain vibrant has the rules that attract people to build global businesses out of London. Okay, on that relatively optimistic note, uh, can I thank you, uh, Pier Paolo Barbieri, uh, for, you know, look, it's a really interesting venture that you started. I can see that the sky's the limit. And uh, I'm, I know that you're mobbed you're up right. with... You're mobbed up with all this sort of these thinkers of the future like George Soros and Nicholas Bergeron. Um, and I'm curious to know what they think also. But I think you've given us a little window into the future and I'm very, very grateful to it. And I'm also grateful to my colleague, Leighton Hughes, for getting you and for putting some of the questions. And of course- Always a pleasure. Watching. I, I, I greatly enjoy my discussions with you. So I hope this is not the last one. Thank you for your time. So do and, I uh, hope it's not the last one. Thanks a lot. Um, thanks.